I'd like to talk a little bit about the growth design connection, in particular for just a moment. And, and, and this, is, this is really kind of the, the coming together of the work that I've been doing really over the past five years. I think the most compelling argument for managers who care about organic growth to learn more about design thinking was absolutely captured in what we learned in this uh, kind of large three-year research we did studying managers who'd been successful at creating better than market organic growth over a period of time in their organizations. Right? So this was research we were doing completely aside from the design thinking piece. I mean, I wasn't making any explicit attempt whatsoever to, to link it. But this is what we found. We basically found that the successful managers had a growth mindset and their outlook was life is a journey of learning. Okay? Uh, the opposite mindset, which I'll talk about for a minute, which I think is such an obstacle to growth and to adopting some of these principles, uh, psychologists call a fixed mindset. And the outlook of a fixed mindset is life is a test, try never to look stupid. Right? Which is sadly, I believe, much more the culture of most business organizations than the life is a journey of learning piece. Right? But if we start out, these managers started out, the successful ones, really believing in this notion that I am a learner. Right? And, and it's really persistence and hard work and keeping at it that, that helps me to succeed. And because of that, they accepted uncertainty. And increasingly, I've come to believe that the core to why all this stuff is important is because almost everything we teach in a traditional business school is predicated upon notions of predictability and certainty. And so we teach tools and methodologies which are wonderful and perfectly appropriate in a stable environment when managers are running a maintenance business. But none of that stuff helps them. In fact, it grossly gets in their way of success when they step into an environment of uncertainty. So what we found is these managers, in part because of their outlook, if you're a learner, you can't learn in an environment of certainty. right? You know it already. They accepted uncertainty. They sought new experiences. So by the time we met them as middle managers, they had a very broad repertoire of experiences. They would tried a lot of stuff. Right? And that broad repertoire kind of set the stage for the rest of their success. They understood their customers as people. And again, not connecting with human-centered design or user-driven design or any of that language. We just noticed that these managers talked about their customers in a completely different way. Um, one of my favorite stories was the guy who runs the custom M&M Mars business. And we asked him, when he talked to his people about being customer driven, what did, what, did, what, did we, what did he mean by that? And he said, I don't ask my people to be customer driven. I expect my people to be Cynthia driven, or Cynthia centric, he called it. And we said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, let me tell you the story of Cynthia. Okay, Cynthia is a young, single mother living on very limited income and has a very big special treat for her son. She ordered custom M&Ms that said, happy birthday, Johnny, for his fifth birthday and then we delivered them two days after the party, right? And again, if you contrast that knowing of customers with our traditional business knowing, Cynthia's demographic is she's 18 to 25 years old, average median income of X, 1.2 children, da, 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 right? Completely different knowing, and when we're looking at growth, almost impossible to detect unarticulated needs in customers that are the source of profitable organic growth. Right? So these managers did that. So they found new growth opportunities easy to see. And then, and this was most interesting to us, they absolutely managed risk through action. And this notion of how we handle risk, design has a lot to teach us about. Right? So as, as managers, we're taught to avoid risk for the most part. But if you work with entrepreneurs, you know that entrepreneurs don't avoid risk but they don't seek risk either, they manage risk. And if you have tools to manage risk, you can do things that people who are avoiding it can't. So what we saw was these managers managing their risk, we called it placing small bets fast, but they succeeded often because they would put a portfolio of small bets out there with very minimal investment, they would quickly learn which ones looked like they were going to work, and they'd kill the ones that didn't look good and they'd move forward with the ones that did. So, I mean, they looked like they never failed because they didn't show corporate 
anything until they knew it had a good shot at success, right? And that reinforced their notion that, that life is a journey of learning. And now, if you look at the behaviors of those managers, right? Where do you look to help managers understand people and how they think and what they want but can't tell you, right? What they need but can't tell you. Clearly, you look to design. How do you understand how to manage risk and play small bets, right? Well, you teach people how to prototype. You teach them how to treat a new business idea as a hypothesis and test it. So when we stepped back from this, it kind of occurred to us, wow, these people are acting like designers. You know, now they've never heard, I mean, they, they, they've never been talked to about design thinking at all. You know, they don't think of what they're doing as prototyping, or they certainly don't think they're, they're journey mapping customers. This is just who they are and how they behave. But if you contrast that with the managers who were failing on the other side, you'll see why we really need to teach design to almost everyone. If I believe that life is a test, I'm going to be afraid of uncertainty, right? And in fact, for most managers and most organizations, life is a test, right? And because of that, they don't try, right? Because if I'm really afraid of uncertainty, I'm going to avoid new experiences, right? I'm going to become a technical expert. I'm going to be raised in a silo. And so when I reach my mid-career as a manager, I have a very narrow repertoire. And this is what we're finding, right? In a lot of situations, we've raised managers through organizations with very narrow repertoires. Right? It gives them no breadth to innovate from. Right? And then when we add to that, they understand customers only as data. Right? They can quote you any statistic on any market from a thick market research report, but you don't find unarticulated needs doing focus groups and surveys. Right? So you take a superficial understanding of their customers and a narrow repertoire and new ideas are very hard to find, right? You just have no raw material to work with. And then you add to that that we teach managers to manage through analysis. Kind of mind boggling when you think about it. We ask managers to prove that something that doesn't exist yet is a good investment using data from the past, which is all we've got. Right? And so what we found is time and time again, these managers paradoxically end up placing bigger bets than the managers on the other side. But they place them much more slowly because, of course, they spend a year trying to talk finance into letting them make a modest capital investment. Right? So when you, and they place one bet. Right? The design thinking manager over here is, has a portfolio of small bets. On the other side, they've got a portfolio of one big bet, generally. And when it goes belly up, which it frequently does, then the world is confirmed for them that it's a dangerous place and you better not try again because this is what happens. Right? So the opportunity to teach the behaviors of the people on this side of, of, of the cycle to the ones on the other side of the cycle, I think, is the greatest opportunity we have in leadership development today. Right? We can argue that we can find the natural people who are just born with a mindset of growth and naturally listen to their customers and naturally experiment in the real market. The reality of it is there are very few managers, once we're finished with them in management education and in corporate development, that, that, that do much of this stuff. Everybody's on the other side. And where do we have a set of techniques and practices that can actually help someone develop a skill set they don't own, I think it's the world of design. So the magic of design thinking, I love this. Tim Brennan of Apple's Creative Services drew the following diagram when someone asked him you know, what design was about. Right? As long as managers think that that is what design is about, we won't be able to carry the potential that we know it has to them. Right? And, and I was telling the students, I blame Apple. Right? They've both brought design to everyone's attention, and they've also communicated a message that design is the product of single geniuses, like Steve Jobs. Right? So the question is, how do we send a different kind of message about what design is? Right? And, and the ability normal managers have to, to do it. Well, if we think of design as just a systematic approach to problem solving, right? it's a different approach in that it has a couple of characteristics. 
I would say, and again, any designer we ask would probably come up with a slightly different set of characteristics and a different definition. But to me, the core of design is empathy. It's grounded in a deep understanding of human needs, right? And a desire, oh, did I just go off? Oh, I'm back on. A desire to create value for real human beings as its driving core, okay? It's about possibility thinking, right? It's about thinking about possibilities before you start narrowing, diverging before you converge. And finally, it's about iteration. It's about not expecting to get it right the first time. 